and welcome to another episode of Stanford Cinema. As always, I am your host. My name is Andrew. Thank you very much for downloading this latest episode. We are now like inching ever so much closer to our 100th episode. I think this one's 98. And of course, we had to bring back one of our one of our recent uh, new favorites to the show, and that would be, of course, Mr. Dylan Quarles. He'll be out here in just a second, and we're gonna be talking about Gattaca one of my favorite sci-fi flicks. I know we've already covered Starship Troopers and shit. What else did we cover last year? It was another sci-fi movie, but it's totally escaping me. Oh, well. Um, You know, you can take a look in the back catalog, but this will be the third time we've had Dylan on the show. I'm super excited to welcome him back. And this is going to be a lengthy conversation, so let's just get into it. If you haven't already subscribed to my podcast, please do so. You can find me just about anywhere. And the fact that you're listening to me now means you found me somewhere. So yeah, subscribe, tell your friends, leave a review, and and uh, let's enjoy this journey together. And speaking of journeys, we are going to take a trip to Gattaca. And well, that, was a, that was a tasty little segue. So uh, let's dive right on in. Another little segue because there's anyway i'm just gonna shut up i'm gonna get into the show let's talk with dylan let's go dylan what is going on man how are you andrew it's so good to be back on your show i am doing beautifully not quite as good as if i'd been genetically engineered to be doing beautifully but pretty good for an invalid i will say oh look at that you get or you get two God references Earth. in like the in like the first like intro right there i love it i love it <laughs> yeah um have we have i seen this recording space that you're in right now i don't know if i have i don't know if i've I've seen what it, let's see is that like a donkey and a giraffe behind you yeah there's a donkey mask for those at home uh this is an audio podcast obviously so let's talk about what you can see uh or they can't see we've got a donkey we've got a giraffe these come from mexico and then right over here across my uh other shoulder are uh egg cartons that have been spray painted black Oh, I have look seen the egg cartons. I guess the we have new yeah, editions. I talk, I talk about the egg cartons kind of a lot. I think I, I think I'm like insecure about them, so I just try to get out ahead of it. Like, yes, listen, this is a janky home operation, and no, I'm not going to buy soundproofing paneling, even though I know it's cheap. Uh, I just, I just work with what I have. Egg cartons, which in this economy, I mean, come on, right? Yeah, for sure. Uh, so, w- what is new with you? Have you? I mean, at last we talked. Uh, and this might've been like an off air conversation, but you yourself were thinking about, you know what? I might, I might be able to get into this whole like podcasting universe. Is that ah, something I like that this. you're working on? You're teeing me up. I, I am working on it. Um, with my co-host Cameron Roberts, which is a name that will mean nothing to the world unless you're live where I live. But if you live where I live, this guy is kind of a big deal. Like Ron Burgundy. No, he, he owns uh, a group of bars and they're like so cool. They're very like, they're very awesome bars. You know, they're not just like, they're not just like some kind of cookie cutter Applebee's welcome to the neighborhood bullshit. Like these are real deal bars. Uh, so he's a bar guy. He's also a film dude like me. And I went to film school and I'm a writer. So I think about films and I think about words and I think about things and I think too much. Uh, so we kind of pooled our talents together to, we're getting it off the ground. Uh, it's we're tentatively calling it Barstool Film School, and the kind of thrust of the program is we will talk about films, a film each week, kind of how you do, or maybe every other week. But at the end of the episode, we'll ask each other and ourselves and anyone listening, "Is this a good bar movie?" Because you know there are good mm. movies, but there are also good bar movies, and sometimes they intersect. And sometimes they don't like uh, the Godfather is a good movie. Is it a good bar movie though, Andrew? Not really. Right. Like there's a lot of that. So it's like, what goes into making a good bar movie? That's what we're going to be plumbing the depths of uh, in each episode. We have recorded our inaugural episode. Um, Cameron then got on a jet airplane and flew off to Thailand for over a month and a half. So now he's back. Uh, his bars have a Thai, a Thai theme. His wife is Thai. They kind of do like a Thai fusion. So he went over there to do market research. I think that's what he's going to put on his taxes. Sorry, buddy. But um, now he's back. So we're back in the studio. 
uh, we did Speed as our inaugural episode. So look for yeah. that somewhere. Yeah. Right. It seems like almost the quintessential bar movie. But yeah. for our second episode, we wanted to do something funky and take like a, a complete left turn and like subvert people's expectations. You know, they think it's going to be like Face Off and T2 and Alien. And, and those movies are going to work their way in. Don't worry about oh, it. You know, yeah, they'll be there. They have to. But we want it to be like, you know, there are other movies that don't work at your house, kind of like almost like the opposite of The Godfather, like movies that actually suck, but in a bar, they're kind of good. Like so Batman for our, and Robin. Yeah, that's a great example. That could be an episode that might need to be an episode. If it's an episode, Andrew, we should remote you in. I'm, 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 I'm saying it. I'm committing you to it. I mean, anytime uh, we'll you want. Out. Just if you ever need a like a, you know, just a casual like color commentary. Eh, no, that's yeah. that's more your feet. If you want just the <laughs> the like the historian that tries to make the shitty film sound official, that's mm. that, that's more me. Well, when we do Batman and Robin, Andy, you're on. So I'll take it for our sec for our second episode. We're we're going to go. We're going to take a dip into the Shyamalan waters. We're going to go lady in the water because that is a bad movie. Interesting. But is it a good bar movie? I I mean, there's a lot of fucking chaos that goes on in that movie. I don't right. know. I don't know if it's a good and bar movie. Um, you could really get into like different types of bar movies, though, right? Like there's the yeah. kind like Speed. Speed is the kind of movie where like if that's on in the bar, if you met somebody at that bar to catch up, you won't be catching up. Right. You'll be watching Speed together with the closed captioning on over the bartender's shoulder. Uh, Lady in the Water, though, uh, that's the kind of bar movie where it's like you're watching it and you're like, what the hell is going on? And then like all of a sudden it starts getting like too Lady in the Water y. Mm -hmm. And you're like, that's, I, I got to go order another round of drinks. And you walk away for a bit and then you come back and you're like, wait, is that a dog made out of grass? Uh, what's Bob Giamatti doing? And then you walk away and then you come back. So it's like, it also might be a good bar movie, but just a different type of good bar movie. Anyway, that's yeah, what no, we're working I, I think it's a wonderful concept. It, it, it reminds me of a time. Uh, within the past 10 years, I used to live in a uh, wonderful town called Austin. And mm. we, my, my now wife, then girlfriend and I, we would frequent different places around town. And there was a spot we liked. It was called Casino El Camino. Wonderful wow, what a name. name. What a wonderful yeah. name. And it was a dive bar, but the best, the best burgers in Austin. And mm. They Growing would play the just nothing but like drive in and campy bullshit. And yeah. one night we were there after like going to a concert somewhere at like Stubbs, which is a barbecue joint, but also like music venue, like famous music venue in Austin. And they were playing this movie called The Hand, not to be mistaken with Idle Hands, although the premise isn't too completely. Is this, is this the Jeff Fahey movie? No, this is a Michael okay. Caine movie. Whoa. Oh. we're talking like 1980 Michael Caine Whoa. and essentially he's a cartoonist and huh. you know he, he he he's a cartoonist he he draws he uses his hand but he and his mm. his wife who are going through maybe a separation they don't know they're getting in an argument and they're driving along and there's this car honking behind them and he's like just go around go around and then they, they get into this horrible car accident. He loses his hand. Wow. And as a cartoonist, that's his whole world. Um, but he gets like these phantom like dreams and no, they couldn't find the hand. They, they, they couldn't like the hand just disappeared. It's gone. They can't find uh. it. No, like it just got lopped off in wonderful like 1980 special effect. <laughs> and they're all like going through the brush trying to find this fucking hand they can't find it they but, got like the, like, the they have, like the dogs names. out like the sniff dogs and like the yeah. they're, they're forming a line and all that <laughs> can't find his hand and he's all like distraught but then then chaos happens with his idle hand essentially just mm. doing wreaking havoc and there was, I mean, we were at a bar watching just like, what the fuck is this? Because one, it was like 1980. So you have all of that, which is perfect because yeah, like, campy early 80s shitty horror film. Two, it's Michael Caine with long hair, which is also just something completely insane. He's, Michael Caine is crazy. He's one of these like Tommy Lee Jones guys. It's like unsettling to see him young. Yeah. Yeah. Very. Yeah. Very. 
And then you just add the fact that there's just a, a walking, you know, uh, thing happening in the whole movie. It's just like this hand going around wreaking havoc. And it almost seems like a spiritual sequel or a spiritual prequel to that Fahey movie. I was, I, I was referencing what this movie is the Jeff Fahey movie. It's called body parts. It's, it's a nineties oh, movie. And I, you're on a nineties kick right now, right? I mean, I'm watching a little, I mean, we, well, this is a nineties one. We, we did, we did a nineties, you know what, whatever, you know, there, there's no rhyme or reason. I wanted to do themes this year, but it's all fucking like, uh, just, I didn't, I didn't mean to blow up your spot, dude. But this Fahey movie, he loses a hand in a car accident, which is crazy. Uh, he's like a psychologist, I think, or something mm-hmm. like a, maybe a criminal psychologist. And um, he gets he gets his he gets a hand transplant. But the hand that he gets transplanted is the hand of a serial killer that was executed on death row. Ooh. And he starts having like insane visions and the hand is like getting up to some some stuff um there's a, a really uncomfortable finger bang scene involving <laughs> the 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 transplanted serial killer hand it's a it's quite a ride um it was during that time in the 90s when jeff Fahey was kind of trying to become a thing sort of around psycho 3 and all that um was it around the same time that he did the uh lawnmower man oh, sh- i knew you were gonna say that it must be that's how fucking hilarious how many people on this earth Andrew, this is why we have a friendship, because I knew you were going to say the Lawnmower Man sequel when he takes over for our good friend uh, Jeff Daniels there. Uh, wait, is he in the original Lawnmower Man or am I having he a complete stroke? He is the original Lawnmower Man. He is the original. That's right. OK, so it's not him in the sequel. It's him in the original Lawnmower yeah. Man. I always think that's Jeff Daniels for some reason, because he's like playing basically the same character from Dumb and Dumber. He's playing Lloyd. So I, I always just get that. Yeah. Or Harry. Like, you know, I, there is definitely a conversation for the lawnmower man because it's fucking like bonkers because of the fact that like, like Stephen King had to sue them because it had nothing to do with what his story is. Oh my like, God. The lawnmower, the lawnmower man, man does, short story. It, yeah. Right? The lawnmower man short story is definitely has absolutely nothing to do with the way nothing, that film turned nothing out. Nothing at all. It's literally like a weird dude, like eating fucking grass. Um, yeah. It's like yeah. some paganism kind of vibe yeah. or something. And then Lawnmower Man is like some like 90s virtual reality, weird internet shit. Um, Pierce Brosnan is just like so sweaty and shirtless that entire movie. Fucking like the movie is just insane. And then, of course, you've got Jeff A. Um, yeah. You know what? I could just do just a, a non whatever episode of just us just chatting for two hours. But. I do want to talk about Gattaca because of the fact that this movie is something that that I that I hold in such like high high esteem and you kind of yeah. teased it at the outset but let's let's kind of segue now that we've been chatting for about 10 minutes or so and let's 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 get into Gattaca. When Yeah. Uh when was the last time you saw this movie? Uh, prior to before I, this, prior to the rewatch, I will tell you that. But before I tell you that, I have to say to the to those listening in the world, um, ear, ear fans of the show, obviously, because you're here listening. Um, normally, Andrew lets the guest pick the movie, but this is a stamper select. Mm. This is a stamper selection. This was your pick, man, and I love mm-hmm. this movie. And I'm actually really glad that you picked it because I own it. That's how much I love it. I. I have a modest DVD collection because streaming came along and, you know, annihilated owning DVDs. Um, I know there are people out there screaming in their car that you should always still buy physical media if you like it. And I agree with you, but uh, ain't nobody got time for that. So, um, but I do own Gattaca. And so to answer your question, I'm, I'm glad you made me watch it again. But to answer your question, it had been probably since about 2010 or 11 ish. I think I was trying to watch it right before the world ended in 2012. But then, um, as we all know, the world didn't end. So that year I spent just like cramming movies, uh, that I was hoping to like have flash before my eyes, you know, as like the earth was blowing apart or whatever was supposed to happen in 2012 ended up being kind of a wasted year, but it's all good because, um, I watched so many movies that year that I sort of like forgot the finer points of Gattaca. Like you were said, you said, let's do Gattaca. I'm like, oh yeah, Gattaca. It's the, it's the eugenics movie. 
But then I'm watching it and I'm like, oh, this shit's happening in the movie that I completely forgot was like part a central to the plot even or important. So long story short, thank you, Andrew Stamper, for selecting Gattaca for this week's episode because it was a joy to watch. Well, well, thank you. And yes, this is a, a, a Stamper selection, if you will. Man, I'm, I'm a big fan of where things sound with start with the what the fuck is that called? Oh, alliteration. I Thank got you. you. Alliteration. Jesus. Like I, I literally t- tell people that, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a sucker for alliteration. So that's why I'm all of this whole thing became, uh, came to be, but yeah. So this is also a stamper selection. Funny enough, this whole podcast came about because of COVID sitting yeah. around the house, watching all the movies that I enjoy, but then got getting tired of watching my movies. I'm like, I'm curious to know what, Dylan is watching or my buddy John sure. is watching or whatever. So what are you watching? And the podcast came to be, you choose it. I watch it. We talk about it. So therefore I would watch your movie. Great and model. It, totally it, upended, but it's okay. Yeah. Um, and for the most part, that's what this podcast has been with, with few exceptions. And, and we had a conversation because anytime I can bring you back to the show, because I think we've got, I think we've got really good banter and you're mm-hmm. you're 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 enjoyable and you're a fun guest. And hey. by the way, I didn't even like once once said I like your work. By the way, um, having now like read your stuff, hey, like you know, not to make this about hey, I also enjoy your work. But now that I've actually read your work, I think you're pretty fucking gifted, man. I, I just got to right. I got to say, I, like, I've told my friends like, oh yeah, and I've li- I mentioned on it before. Hey, be sure to check out Dylan's work. But I've never actually told you I like your work. So, um, <laughs> well, thank you, Andrew. I do it just for you. Well, I appreciate that. I, did, I, appreciate I don't that. think you knew that, but uh, this has all been a long, long con. You've been, been going the on game. Since, the long game. This has been going on since like 2010, and it's all coming together. Those who are out there listening right now, you can't see, but my fingers are fully steepled right now. Yeah. He he. Uh, so Dylan read one of my screenplays that that I received a grant for back in like 2011, <laughs> and he's like, "I got to be friends with that guy." And yeah, so yeah, exactly. I'm just gonna write a bunch of shit. I'm not gonna talk to him, and then we'll I'm gonna wait for this pandemic to happen. Yeah, and and then I'm gonna wait for him to create a listing of like, "Hey, I would like for somebody to be on my show," and then yeah, and only then it. will I reach out to him. And then I will strike. That will be my moment. And then I will strike. (laughs) I will answer that listing while I'm sitting on the toilet. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, (laughs) Just a just just a a barrage of uh, amazing, amazing uh, history there. But (laughs) getting into why we're really here today. And by the way, before, you know, fuck it, I'm just going to segue again. Cheers to you. I see you're having a little something. I'm having a yeah, little. Yeah, I of course am. Always. I always am. Cheers. What is that? A little wine tonight or what do you got? Uh, I am actually drinking Fernet Branca, which is an Amaro, I want to say. And if I'm wrong, don't send me hate mail. Don't send get enough me. of that already. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, it's delicious. Uh, it's refreshing. And it's alcoholic and it kind of smells. It doesn't taste like toothpaste, but it kind of <laughs> smells like toothpaste. If you're not familiar with Fernet Branca, it's like one of these Amaros that has like a thousand ingredients in it. That's been made by monks forever in the mountains of wherever the fuck it's like. But it's um, it's a bartender's choice. Like because, type things. Yes, but not. But yes, yeah. but not. Uh, it's it's a it's a it's popular with bartenders. Uh, Cameron, if you're listening and I know you are because you should be because you're my co-host. Uh, he likes it. Because you can um, have a little, you know, while you're on the clock. Not that he ever does that. Because your breath doesn't smell like liquor. It smells like toothpaste. Um, it's It's got all kinds of stuff in it. And honestly, cards on the table. I'm drinking Fernet Branca right now uh, because I finished all my whiskey before we started recording. So this is what I have in the house. Oh, shit. Well, I am sorry. I am drinking whiskey because we had, you know, I'm I'm a little like sentimental. And we had whiskey last time. So yeah, I'm, we sure I was, did. I was going to do a little whiskey tonight. Listen, I don't have a guy buying my blood to keep me in the lifestyle I need to be in. So I don't have whiskey on hand. And I know you're out there selling your genetic material to the to the less fortunate. But some of us, some of us don't have that game going on, Andrew. No, no, no. 
Um, yes. Yeah, well, I guess this is a good little uh, moment to for a little advertisement. Shout out to my people over at Stream Lounge because they're the ones that cut me a little check so I can buy myself a little a little bottle while I'm uh, recording my podcast. Um, what? Really? You got a sponsorship, dude? I wouldn't call it a sponsorship, but they I, I'm a I am one of their their featured broadcasters and I've got some subscribers on there. So they so I get a little monthly little monthly stipend, if you will, uh, just for me watching movies. And if anybody's listening, just go to streamlounge.io and on, you know, three, four times out of the month uh, in the evenings, I will watch a movie and i invite people to watch along with me and you can watch wow. the movie while i'm watching the movie and you can interact with me it's kind of like twitch uh, or kind of hmm. like youtube but you yourself are watching the movie and That's then cool. there's like a little tiny little screen on the side where you can see me talking about what you are seeing as we're watching it or really just as we have this whole like zencaster thing right there like i'm on your big screen you've got like 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 a tiny little window of yourself and there's like a little chat bar same concept and wow and it, it's great so it works whether you've got like youtube or hbo or netflix or disney or uh shutter or whatever like whatever streaming platform you just log into this website and it, it works with your stream so you're not doing anything illegally you get to watch the shows there and People can chat with you. And this company that hit me up almost going on two years ago said, hey, we would like to uh, have you be one of our like our featured people. And I said, sure, why not? I watch movies anyway. So Rad. let's do it. And then they said, we'll give you some money. And I'm like, OK, well, that oh, works even better. And congratulations. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, so, you know, I buy a buy a bottle, buy a bottle a month. Uh, on uh on my people at stream lounge so wow anyway thank thank you stream lounge for andrew's whiskey yes yes so now that we've done that we've paid all those paid our sponsors that you know uh that they didn't ask for it let's get into this movie i can't wait let's do it yeah so gattaca uh again this was a selection that i wanted because usually what i'll ask is how did you discover this movie? Why did you want to talk about this movie? Mm -hmm. And so I guess I will, I'll take the lead uh, here. Yeah, go for it. So hey, Gattaca, Andrew, how did you discover this movie? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, I was one of the few people that saw this movie in the movie theater. I remember when this movie was being advertised and I thought it was hysterical that Essentially, what was going on was a marketing term or like marketing firm had reached out to people and asked if people wanted to more or less uh, find a way to genetically engineer their own children. And yeah. and thousands of people reached out and it's like, no, 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 this is just a marketing campaign. We're trying to like pitch a movie or whatnot. And hearing about that i'm like oh that's 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 wonderful i don't know if i saw it on the today show or entertainment weekly but oh, i wow. heard about that i'm like that sounds interesting I wonder what this movie is all about mm. and then you find out what this movie is about i'm like oh this is something that i'm all about and at its core what this movie is you know we're in the not too distant future and people are essentially genetically like engineered right you can yeah you can CRISPR babies. Pardon me? CRISPR babies is CRISPR what they would babies, be called yeah. now. Yeah. You you can whittle away all the bad shit, right? You can whittle away heart disease or obesity or uh, violence. Pardon me? They have a, a line in there, I think, where it's even like violence. violence you can like yeah. you can take out violent tendencies and stuff. Mm -hmm. You can whittle away whittle away all like the, the bad shit that you don't want. And our hero comes from like the old school, like his mom and his dad, you know, they just went to town that had a kid and out he came. But when, they, yep. when, he, when he came out, they found out that, you know, he was predisposed to a myriad of different things, as we all are. Right. And the like glasses wearers right here. You can't see us at home, but both Andrew and I, between us, there's eight sets of eyes going on here. Yeah. Yeah. It, 
And, uh, you know, we're in this world where they can cut that shit out. And right. he was not, he was, he was not done, uh, done that way. But we are now in a society where essentially the, the, the finer genes have seniority and in, in preference when it comes to whatever they want to do. And right. depending on how perfect you are, you know, the, the, the more, the more privileges that you have. And so right. and they say, they say it's illegal to mm-hmm. discriminate. He, he says it in the, in the voiceover and yet everyone does it. Yep. So it's like, it's supposed to be illegal to discriminate on some, uh, against somebody for having, and I'm using air quotes here cause I don't want to end up in hot water, inferior genes, but everybody does it. Yeah. So you find yourself in this world wherein like kind of, I mean, there's some, there's a lot of analogies going on, right? Like for race and uh, other things. Yeah. Uh, they, they sort of smartly don't hit that hammer too hard on the head. Like, I feel like if they reboot this movie, um, which I don't think they should, but they might, it, they almost, they are, well, they will almost certainly cast a person of color just to really drive home. Like you know, the anal- the analogy that they're kind of trying to make somewhere you know, it's, it's, in this it's movie. It's really interesting you bring that up because you know we still are just in really at like the beginning moments of trying to describe this movie. But when you talk about it, they were trying to make that today. I even reference like heart disease, and when you really think about it, there is what less than maybe five people of color in this movie, right? There's, like, there's a lot of background characters that are. Um, and like small bit players, because I, I was kind of like weirdly hyper aware. I was looking for it to see if like the the world had moved. This future has moved past race and they've found a new thing to discriminate against. And mm-hmm. it's it's the again, air quotes, the genetically inferior, the invalids yeah. uh, or what there's a word they have like uh, like God, God's hands or something like babies that are just born. Like, they was just a god child god child something like that like throwing basically just old school how how, how you and i are born and everyone listening mm-hmm. uh, unless you're a secret crisper baby in which case wow uh why are you listening to this and not ruling the world but like so there are some players like even when um in the beginning of the toward the beginning of the film when ethan hawks doing his narration about the world he's doing of that bit of world building describing some of these things that you're talking about he goes in for a job interview and um, he's saying it's illegal to discriminate and it's illegal to like ask somebody for a sample of their DNA, but it's legal to ask for a urine sample for a drug test. And the, and the guy in the interview that, that he's, that he's entered into who slides the urine cup to him is a black guy. So it's sort of like laid out right there that like, now he's being discriminated against. Mm-hmm. So like there are people of color in the film, but none of the main characters, because unfortunately this, mo- I mean, for- this movie was, is a product of its era, even if it was trying to say and do things that were kind of advanced. So like, of course a nineties film mm-hmm. is not really going to place anybody of color in a prominent role, which is a problem. They did try though, by putting characters in these certain roles, um, to kind of like show you because the, the movie is conscious of the fact that this is supposed to be the future and advanced. Yeah. So, so they, they, they do that in a different way. Yeah, um, absolutely. Which, which falls short, you know, ultimately of like being totally egalitarian or uh, really practicing like equity, but they still do try to make sure that message is received that now the people being discriminated against aren't discriminated uh, based on the color of their skin, but like, a blood test or a urine test and what that tells you about that person and any kind of like deficiencies they might have genetically and, and all of that stuff too. Like even in the film, they say, and, and Ethan Hawke's character proves this, like it's all, um, it's all like a numbers game. It's all about percentages. Like he's supposed to have heart disease. He's supposed to die of heart disease as spoiler alert at the end of the film. He's, still alive so you know it sort of shows the flaw in this society that Mm -hmm. like you are depriving yourself of as a society potentially 
brilliant and amazing individuals because you're judging them before they even get a chance to like, you know, display what they might or might not bring to the table. Yeah, no, for sure. For sure. Um, wonderful. I think we're going to get into so much of this, but we've kind of outlaid this, this society, but the plot of this movie is this invalid, this person that was born of a natural birth finds his way working for a futuristic version of, of NASA, essentially. Or like and, SpaceX, maybe even. Or a SpaceX, yeah. It's, and, it's unclear, but it's, yeah. it's something. Yeah. He wants to be an astronaut, but the only way he would be an astronaut is if he, if he was of the genetically elite, but he's not. So therefore, he's right. going to be, he, he's going to be, you know, uh, discriminated against. But he's, he's going to be a his, janitor. The only way, as his father, his father uh, stated, the well, only way yeah. that the, the closest he'll get is by cleaning, essentially, the, the yeah, spaceship. He says the only way you'll see the inside of his spaceship is cleaning it. Yeah. Which is thanks. like, thanks, Dad. Yeah, thanks, Dad. <laughs> Literally, the definition of thanks, Dad. And yeah. he leaves home, and he, he makes his way, actually, despite all odds, um, eh, uh, he, he finds his way actually being an employee, uh, employee, and now he's on the verge. He's one week away. But you find out the reason why he's one week away is right. he... One week away from going into space. Going into space. He he's goes almost on achieved to like the, that dream. Yeah, the, the few, yeah exactly. Uh, to achieve the dream that he wants is he goes into like the, the future black market, and he's going to borrow somebody else's DNA. And I love this whole idea. Pardon me. I love that idea, by the way, which is like obviously the main one of the main ideas of the film. But it, it, it's what's so great about sci-fi. Like I love sci-fi, obviously, but this concept, like you set this world up, and then you have this thing that's seemingly niche, but it's all it's almost like reverse engineered. Like somebody had the idea of a black market um, individual who's going to help you circumvent this awful uh totalitarian kind of like and totally biased system and then you come up with the system because yeah. like uh enter tony shalhoub I, not we keep talking we, we're talking about this person as if it's not tony shalhoub it's it's fucking ethan hawk calls tony shalhoub antonio scarcacci from wings yeah. yes or uh or uh primo from big night Big yeah, night. Oh my God. Yeah. Good reference. Yeah. Hell yeah, buddy. Deep cut. Yeah. So he comes along sans that awful Italian accent. I love that movie. Tucci. If you're listening, I, I do love that movie, but um, yeah. And he's in this movie for only like 10 minutes, but he is like making an impact. Obviously mm -hmm. his character is massively important and his presence is massively important. Um, And if you'll allow me, I just have to say this movie, Tony Shalhoub, uh, kind of kicked this idea off for me. It, it, it got my radar going. This movie has a weirdly stacked cast. Like oh. suddenly people are showing Alan Arkin out of yeah. nowhere as a subordinate yeah. to but that's another awesome. character. But I think that is like, I, I think he's a natural born. You know? I think so too. Or, or like not, you like natural born and he's like cut of, good stuff but mm -hmm. he's not yeah he's not he hasn't been edited like anton who right. is the the lead investigator in the in the mystery part of this film and mm -hmm. also spoiler alert ethan hawk's brother bum, bum, bum. which is a bum, bum, which is a whole thing uh did you notice by the way when it's like early on when we're still using um when we're like laying the groundwork for Ethan Hawke's sort of like journey to Gattaca, which is like the SpaceX or NASA company. Um, and we're using, I love this. We're using an actor to play young Ethan Hawke. We're not Benjamin yeah. buttoning Ethan Hawke, which I mean, I miss those days. Just find a kid who looks kind of like Ethan Hawke and give the poor guy a few bucks. You know what I mean? To like take his swing in Hollywood. Um, but when we're doing that whole sequence, um, and he's and we're demonstrating that he's been obsessed with space since he was a little guy. Um, and he's laying out all the planets and the and the and, and he's doing it to scale, like on that basketball court, like, you know, and he's counting out the paces between oh, this many paces between Earth and this many paces between Venus and on and on. Uh he he 
puts an apple down as he goes way out past the asteroid belt and on and on and on. He puts an apple down and then his brother Anton picks it up and takes a bite. And he says, Anton, don't eat Pluto. And I had an LOL that in this future, Pluto is still a planet <laughs> because, I mean, the movie came out in the 90s. Yeah. Well, isn't it a planet again? Didn't they make it's, it? A- oh, oh, my God. Did we overrule Sir Neil deGrasse Tyson's uh, I, I want a tyrannical decla- declaration that Pluto is no longer a planet? Because I remember like like when we killed Pluto, but I want to say like we we brought Pluto back. Did we not? You say we. It was Neil. Neil deGrasse did that. Yeah. Neil Neil deGrasse was the one. He was the guy. It was like Franz Ferdinand. He's the one who fired the shot at Pluto. I don't know if Pluto's back being a planet or not, but it did get a hearty belly laugh from me that um, at least in this future, um, Pluto according is still a Wiki, planet. It, it, according to Wikipedia, it's, you know, it's that dwarf planet status. But uh, I don't know what, like, I just remember, like, just the, all right, let's give a little love back to Pluto. You know, it's, let's it's toss Pluto a bone, you know, yeah. what is, what's Pluto got going for it? It was a planet. Now it's not. I mean, that's just not fair. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, sorry. No, and, and you know, there's definitely conversation because we'll get into Titan and all sorts of fun shit. But so anyway, uh, circling back to, to to the plot, we've got this guy that's born natural and he's got all these things that are all these cards that are stacked against him. He uh, gets a, a DNA doppelganger on the black market. He gets his job and now he's a week from space. Everything is perfect. Everything is going according to plan. Except now somebody dies where he works and there's a big investigation. Murder. And, and then somebody they, is murdered. Yeah, someone is murdered. Someone is murdered at his, you know, his workplace. Not bring Gattaca. in the cops, bring in Alan Arkin, bring in Lauren Dean, uh, aka mm-hmm. spoiler alert, his brother's uh his brother. And yeah. and they find and Dean, DNA sample. Dean Norris. Dean Norris makes oh, an Dean appearance. Dean Norris is in this as well. Randomly. Yeah. As a yeah. flat foot. Yeah. you got Lauren as a Dean. Yeah. Lauren Dean Norris. Oh my God. Yeah. Uh, so oh my gosh. Yeah. Um, but anyway, they find I do, love the, I do love that setup. The way they like, like you're saying, like the movie starts and it, and you are aware that he is gaming the system because it shows you like he's in that uh uv shower in the beginning and he's scrubbing any any one of my skin cells the movie is like that those deep close close-ups of like yeah uh, like skin shavings and hair follicles and just like the the sound effects and like the blue right. lighting and it just yeah so it's, it's, and it's got so that cool fucking like ridiculous uh michael nyman score which is mm-hmm. Which is beautiful in this movie. It's perfect, it's perfect for the movie, for sure. Mm-hmm. And it shows Ethan Hawke, you know, um, attaching like a urine bag to his leg with like a hose, presumably down his hog. And then he's got this like fake fingertip he puts on that has a little tiny blood pouch in it. So you're seeing all of this before. You, so it's like they're not hiding right away. They don't hide that Ethan Hawke is an invalid, um, which is what they call people like him in this world. Um, and or at least like that's what Gattaca calls them because Gattaca is mm-hmm. like extra super like tight about who they allow to be part of their astronaut program. Um, but like what you don't see right away is like the whole back end of that with like Tony Shalhoub, which we already talked about, like is this black market guy and and the other major player in this movie. Um, but like I kind of love the way it's like you see his process and it almost like tricks you into thinking he's doing this all on his own. Um, because in the, like I said, in the beginning of the film, it's just him going through all these steps and preparing uh, how he gets into Gattaca each day without them realizing that he's an invalid um, because they have like a finger prick. And again, that's the fake fingertip. And it has a blood pouch. And then it kind of says, OK, let's back up now. It shows him he, he cleans his workspace fastidiously in case he's shed at all during the day, he vacuums everything up. And then he leaves fake hairs around to be found in case anybody wants to you know, invest, like go poking around. Um, and then we have this like, stop, go back, lay out the world to kind of like provide you context with like everything you've just been seeing uh, with the voice. I always kind of loved like the nineties were crazy for voiceovers. You really don't get it that much anymore. And there's been like a decree that came down from the King of cinema that said voiceovers are out, but the nineties were all about like the, like you're like 10 or 15 minutes into the movie. And then suddenly there's a voiceover. 
um, which I'm I'm like totally fine with it. And so, yeah, everything that you were describing, you know, he's a natural born baby. And yet the moment he's born, the doctors are like, prick his foot and say, uh oh, heart disease, glasses, he's short, all these things. But then, yeah, he's had this dream of being in Gattaca, going to space. And he's working at Gattaca as a as a janitor. And he has that great line of like saying to his boss, like the boss says, uh, you know, he's like scrubbing a window, a door, a glass door. And the boss says, don't clean it too well. And he says, <laughs> I want it to be clean so that you can someday you'll you can see me on the other side or something to, to that effect. And then he enacts that by he starts that plan into motion by yeah contacting Tony Shalhoub, who puts him in contact with. None other than this movie's maybe second build character or third. Yeah. And that is a young, still haired Jude Law. Yep. And doing his doing my favorite Jude Law, which is drinking uh, and smoking, drinking and smoking. It's talented. Mr. Ripley Jude Law. It's pouty. It's it's pouty. It's moody and it's sexy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he he's super super dashing in his wheelchair and just drinking and smoking himself to death. Um cuz he's he, like one of these super babies, right? He was a super he was a crisper baby. He was, he was yeah, like he basically was like from Krypton more or less. So like he Yeah, he was engineered to be tip top yeah, crime I think, specimen. I think uh I think when they when they uh when she had him like his DNA sampled or what she thought was Ethan Hawke, but it was really in Jude Law, was like 93%. Like, he, yeah. what, what top, that really top. means, we don't know. But yeah. but even uh, but even the woman doing it was like, oh, 93%, that's, you know, like, he's a big fucking deal. And yeah. She being Uma Thurman. Yes. Who is also in this movie. Yeah. Uh, so where Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman met, you know, they, or uh, where, where, mm. rather where they started dating, they may have met Four, but they they their chemistry was unmistakable and they hooked up and they gave us that uh, girl from the stranger things yeah gave us maya gave us maya hawk and they got married until like the (laughs) mid 2000s whatever but um, Maya hawk you're great you're great on stranger things but i mean let's call a spade a spade here nepo baby I mean, it's not it, she. She's not the first. She's not no. even like the, the first ten thousand. You know, like just how no. many nepo babies are there in it's Hollywood? Like, oh, two totally beautiful people who are talented got together and made a had a progeny, and then that progeny is also attractive and talented. What a fucking shock! You yeah, know, shock of shocks. Anyway, yeah, yeah. literally colored me shocked. Um, yeah. I don't think there's really th- anything else to cover in the plot other than the, that, we, that. Sort of catches us up to. Then the movie's like, okay, now it's actually now starting it in earnest. Yeah. Now you did mention a moment ago of the the voiceover aspect, and really, it's like the first half hour. It's a lengthy element, and he comes back and he'll give us you know moments um, in the film, and then he has the great like the final like voiceover moment. Uh, right. The ninety you mentioned like the nineties. You know what? I argue that it's still going even today, and it's just the '90s had a shit ton of them. What I, I feel that maybe you're kind of tapping into is there were a lot of really bad voiceover films in the '90s, mm. and this movie. I don't know. I don't know if it's good or not, but I think in more times than not, I'm like. Uh, I don't know if we really need it. Like, I don't think we needed it in Blade Runner. I don't think we needed the voiceover explanation. That's why like, there's like so many cuts of Blade Runner. Yeah, there's exactly. cuts where there's no voiceover. There's cuts mm-hmm. when there are. Because like sometimes, like what you're touching on a little bit with Blade Runner, if you maybe maybe you didn't mean to, maybe you did. But like sometimes the voiceover is a post production thing. It's a studio thing. It's yeah. like test audiences were too fucking stupid to get this. Please yep. put a voiceover in to help them. But then in some cases, like in this film in Gattaca, I feel that it was actually part of the, probably part of the original script. I don't know that for certain. So if you do, if you wrote the script, I don't want your hate mail. I'm sorry. But like, it seems that it's actually a part of the experience and that it's intended to be, which is why it doesn't really stand out to me as a bad example of voiceover. Right. Even though mm-hmm. it's kind of later, it, it starts a little bit 
late, like 10 minutes into the movie, and then it goes away for a while and then comes back at the end. But it book it more, even though it starts a, like about 10 minutes into the movie, it still does book in the movie in, yeah. a, in a way that feels very intentional. Yeah. It, 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 it's interesting the because I've, I've tried to figure out whether or not I like the voiceover work in this movie or not, because for for what it's worth, I wanted to talk about this movie because I love this movie. I love the idea of uh, human nature um, versus uh, perfection. I love the idea of science versus God. I love, you know, there, there, there are a lot of things that this movie is really tapping into. And again, like eugenics is something that holy shit, how far away are we from that? I mean, shit, we're already there when you really look we're at it. We're there like, now. Yeah, but they have the laws against there, it, but... It's not just uh, for uh, artificial insemination, but just even, like, couples getting together and, like, removing abnormalities or removing uh predisposed you know um conditions and things like that. i mean we're we're like we're there on the we're cost. There. we are and, literally and i don't want to give bad information so definitely google this if you're listening and, and i've and i raise an, a red flag for you but i'm fairly certain that when you uh when you voluntarily allow uh take a g- genetic sequence test to see for yourself if you have any um conditions you might want to know about down the road which is something people do that information can be disclosed to insurance companies and they can choose to not cover you um so we're kind of already heading in that direction a little bit like like i mean and when this movie came out in 97 like the movie like the opening crawl is in the not too distant future yeah, and we are. And there's right... also two quotes. Two quotes. Pardon me. Not one. Not one, but two quotes before this movie. Mm-hmm. That's how you know it's it's prestigious. Yeah. Um. I mean, we are. We're right there. You know. I. I think. I don't know if it was NASA, but I read something that this movie, like NASA, was like, yeah, that's a pretty fucking like accurate sci-fi film. Like it was recognized as like, if not the like one of the most like plausible sci-fi films this movie is stupidly stupidly like right there in the point that people in science like you know what that's a pretty good fucking sci-fi movie in terms of what they're what they're trying to say and what and where we're at in society and like it's one of these it's like a it's like a canary sci-fi movie it's like the canary in the coal mine like sometimes sci-fi comes out and is like hey fyi we're reading the way the wind's blowing right now and um take note because let us present to you a potential outcome yeah. if we don't course correct a bit and the movie came out uh shortly after or or I'm sure it was I'm sure it was shopped around a bit but it was written shortly after uh the first successful genome sequencing you mm-hmm. know which took place in the 90s under the Clinton administration so like the writer whose name escapes me right now Andrew was clearly Nichol. like, okay. So Andrew Nichols clearly like heard the news and was like, immediately saw how that could go horribly wrong if the alarm wasn't sounded. And then in his own way, sounded the alarm because now there are actually safeguards in place, like CRISPR babies in the United States, at least, and more or less across the world. There are some places where, Maybe they're not enforcing these laws. I'm not going to name these countries, but they're the regular players um, that are supposed to scare us all in the middle of the night. Like, you're not allowed to do that. You're not allowed to do CRISPR babies, but they are kicking around loopholes where you might be able to edit out. You know, it starts with editing out disease. It starts with editing out. uh, It starts with editing out perceived um, maladies or things that are bad for the human race, you know, but it ends with, Gattaca. It ends with the film. It ends with people being discriminated against. I mean, we see at one point during uh, the investigation when they're when the police are looking for the murderer, um, and they know the murderer is an invalid because, like you said earlier, before I cut you off, so sorry for that. They do find one of Ethan Hawke's eyelashes at Gattaca, and um, when they're like sucking all the skin cells up, and so they know there's an invalid at Gattaca. Um, 
And so they go out and they just start rounding people up. And it's like, they don't ever say it because this movie doesn't really have a, a very heavy hand in some areas, but it's basically saying that invalids don't have civil rights, like um, the genetically perfect class do, because they're able to just go out and round these people up, you know, and start forcing them to provide DNA so they can see if they were involved in a murder scientific in an office fascism, building. Essentially. Yeah. Yeah. Sci- scientific fascism. Right. Uh, which is a crazy concept to think about. Yeah. I mean, um, we, we had a, a nice like two hour conversation about, about uh, fascism in a previous discussion. And maybe that was part of why I wanted to talk a little bit about this movie as mm. well is because this movie does discuss even even if it's only scratching the surface, I think what Andrew Nichol was bringing to the, the the big picture of of just where we're where we're at and where we're going and that that moment where science catches up and and uh, the where where it catches up, it's it's like it's like about the moment where science caught up. And now we're way past that. And it's like almost like you're looking back and saying, oh, that's the moment that everything changed, but it's already passed and there's nothing you could do about it. Now, like yeah. this entire this entire film at no point in the film is, is Ethan Hawke trying to dismantle, fight or or rebel against the system. He's no. literally just trying to get away with this crime for his own like selfish um desires of going to space and i'm not like p- saying that he's a selfish char- he is actually a selfish character in this film oh, incredible he's a totally selfish character he's totally singularly focused on his own desires it's not necessarily presented as a bad thing even though it kind of is like he, he doesn't give a shit that this guy was murdered in fact the most of the film he's he's joking with uma thurman about the guy being murdered Same because apparently every, sooner, i believe yeah everybody yeah. apparently hated this guy so but it's like at no point are we like uh, Ethan uh, Hawke's character Vincent. At no point are we like Vincent is Luke Skywalker. Vincent is Neo. He's going to wake us all up from the Matrix. Um, they kind of a little bit teeny weeny put that in at the very end with Xander Berkeley again, another random person who shows up in this movie. Xander Berkeley Fucking as crushes. this lab. He kills it as this lab. Te- he kills it in like everything. I, I, yeah. I love Xander Berkeley. Uh, here's a, there you go. There's another connection to Starship Troopers, a guy named Xander. That, it must oh, be the yeah, future. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, yeah. But he's like this test. He, he works for Gattaca and he tests people. So he like, he tests Ethan Hawke every day, he tests his urine to make sure that he's valid, blah, blah, blah. Um, and at the end of the film, uh, there's a surprise test right before Ethan Hawke gets on the rocket ship to go to space. After he's got around all these other obstacles, surprise test. And he's like, he has this moment like, ah, fuck. Well, just remember, you know, I was as good as as good as most and better than some. You know, when you remember when my test comes back and shows that I'm actually not one of these genetically superior specimens, I still beat all these other motherfuckers to go to space. I'm still that good. And Xander Berkeley has this line like, yeah, well, you know, my son didn't turn out to be everything they advertised and he really looks up to you and so it sort of like lets you know that xander berkeley has known all along that he's known the entire fucking time and that's like i want to bring this up later but we're we're here now uh xander berkeley is he he's his father not literally but essentially there's that connection um xander berkeley and and um and Ethan Hawke's character. Oh my god, uh not Jerome. Vincent. Vincent, thank you. Uh Vincent Anton. Um all yeah, you they, see is Jude Law. You looked at his genetics and all you see is exactly. Vincent, right? <laughs> uh, but yeah, he's now, like he, he finally had a man like uh, a guy in his life that believed in him for who he was and and he, he knew he, he knew what he was doing and he's like, My son's a big fan. Why is his son a big fan? Because he's told his son what this guy is doing. Yeah, the, this the only guy why is... his son knows anything is because he he's told, "Hey, there's a guy in my company. He's an invalid, and this is what he's done. He's yeah. defied all these odds." And 
he wasn't doing the only time that he ever, ever does anything wrong is he uh, he, he pushes a button at the end. But the only reason why he knows that he's invalid is because I love this part. How, how dudes hold their dicks. Yeah. And it's it's Ethan, so Hawk, good. Ethan Hawk Vincent is a lefty, which is a, another like coded thing about him being like inferior in some way. Ethan Hawk is a lefty. Jude Law, Jerome, who Ethan Hawk is pretending to be for this entire movie, is a righty. So Ethan Hawk is part of his whole becoming Jerome, which is like a neat little sequence we have. Um, is pra- is learning how to write with his right hand to sign his name with his right hand. Uh, and there's even this like kind of weird scene, like the first time you meet Xander Berkeley when Ethan Hawk goes in for one of his daily or weekly urine tests, and uh, Jerome says something about like, "Hey, you got a you got a nice dick," basically. Because he has to like stand there and watch Ethan Hawke pee into this cup, even though Ethan Hawke has like this tube stealthily hidden. You refer to it as your equipment. Your equipment. And he goes something like hazard of the job. You know, I see a lot of equipment. He's like, your parents got you a nice one or something to that effect. Uh, So that they put that line in there. It seems like it's kind of a funny joke. And then it ends up actually being important later on in the movie when Xander Berkeley is at the very end and Ethan Hawke has to do the urine sample and he's like, Hey, I know I'm going to fail, but just remember I was great. And Xander Berkeley, you know, fudges the results for him so he can still get on the rocket ship and goes just, uh, for future reference, uh, righties, you know, righties hold their, their dick with their right hand, you know, meaning that this whole time, Ethan Hawke, even though he's supposed to be a righty has been holding it with his left hand while he's providing these samples, which Xander Berkeley apparently noticed and must have tipped him off early on uh, so that he would look closer at this guy. Or maybe, who knows? Maybe he saw the, the the plastic pipe or maybe he just knows the tricks of the trade. Because it, it is like Tony Shalhoub's character. He's in business. It's a business. Tony mm-hmm. Shalhoub, the black market genetics guy. I mean, he says when we're introduced to him and there's all this equipment that he gives Jude Law and um, Ethan Hawke so that they can share this identity um, he says, I want 25% of everything you make, presumably for life. Um, so he's in business. So there's like a booming business of these people who are posing as as, as genetically superior um, I, specimens. They're, you know, sharing an identity for one reason or another. In this case, it's because Jude Law is in a wheelchair, um, which is an interesting little uh, story inside this story. Uh, and something that's probably meaty and we should dig into Jude Law edited as he is to perfection is suicidal mm-hmm. and has been since before the events of the film since before he, since before the reason he's in a wheelchair is because he stepped out into traffic and he says he stepped into traffic knowing he was stepping into traffic he it wasn't an accident it wasn't oh I rolled my car I got drunk no He walked into fucking traffic to die, and he did not die. He was crippled instead. Uh, And at the end of the film, because he got a silver, because he got a silver, because he didn't live up to it. So that's sort of like that's sort of like a really interesting critique of this world. It's like if you're literally engineered to be a gold star swimmer, right? He was a swimmer. Yep. And then you win a silver. What does that do? Like you have nothing to hide behind. You can't say. Right, because you've been built to be the best, and then when you are not the best, um, there's so nothing the, left. Uh, the the uh, the fifth element, perfect. Yeah, to be perfect, perfect. There's nothing to hide behind. Uh, Ethan Hawke has an interesting line about it later. Swimming is like weirdly important in this movie, uh, especially swimming at night. Go figure. Oh my god, um, extremely great theme. Night, uh, night, night swimming, but like the mm-hmm. idea that mm-hmm. like. You just, just because you're engineered to do something, there is another component that can't be engineered, that can't be uh, hacked, and that is your will, your your drive. Mm -hmm. Um, That human spirit. Like Ethan Hawke has a swimming contest with his brother, Anton, who goes on to become this detective, which uh, a little bit of the scientific fascist note there, his brother's black jacket is pretty long. It's getting a little long there. It's getting a little... SS it's 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 lengthy yeah. black jacket mm-hmm. this duster anyway they have the swimming contest that they do as kids 
and he beats his brother one day and his brother can't figure out how he beat him um, because Ethan Hawke is supposed to be genetically inferior. Right. And so at the end of the film, when they have their rematch and again, Ethan Hawke beats Anton, he says, I beat you. And they're like out in the waves. And this is very dramatic. He says, I beat you because I never, I don't leave anything left for the swim back. I lay it all on the line for the swim right. out, right? Yeah, I want to. I want to. I want to talk about that because, like, Anton couldn't like fathom like how he beat him once before, and he's like, "How are you doing this again?" He's like, "Yeah, he's like you want to know how I did it? This is how I did it. I never saved anything for the swim back, right? Like, that's just the what whole the idea. Is. Like, I'm giving like this is it. This is all like, and whether or not that was true, like." Mm-hmm. Anton had he was he was afraid now and then right it's almost like it made him cautious knowing that he was perfect it kind of like it knowing that there's nothing left to chance anymore doesn't allow you to gamble with chance like Mm -hmm. Ethan Hawke does like you know he goes into space knowing he has a heart condition he could his heart could fucking explode right after the first atmosphere yeah (laughs) but he puts it all on the line. He goes through this whole elaborate ruse because he's fighting with his, he's, he's bringing everything to the fight with his spirit. Everybody else is bringing it with, with their physical bodies and mm-hmm. all the importance that's been placed on that, which is like one of the very interesting uh, components of the movie, you know, it's like that, the difference between those two things. Yeah. I mean, there are so many ways that this movie could go, Right. I mean, we 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 we've talked a little well shit. Let me just get into it. This movie could be about the whole black market. This movie, could, like this sci-fi right. film, could be a movie about about people trying to hook people up on the block mark the black market about getting right. better coding. You know, like that, yeah. that's a movie in itself. Or people trying to find the guy that's hooking people up with better coding. That in itself is a sci-fi film. Or the murder Uh, mystery, even the the murder mystery is something that this movie is. We have a hero. um, This this is such a fascinating thing when it comes to sci fi movies or action adventure movies. We always like our hero always has some type of like special birth and something that makes him special, something that makes him stand out. What what's interesting about this movie is just how ordinary like his birth is he's just a natural natural birth so his his superhuman strength is by not having any superhuman strength in any capacity his his superhuman strength is is leaving nothing for the swim back yeah yeah Yeah. is putting is laying it all on the line having a dream and laying it all on the line for the dream which is like weirdly reson it resonates you know with yeah. us which is what's part of part of what is brilliant about the film you know is that it it resonates with us watching the film because we are not these characters who are genetically perfect we are anton or yeah. sorry we we are vincent we are vincent we're ethan, we we're, we're ethan Hawk. we wish we were fucking ethan Hawk. by the way the joke one of the big grand jokes of this movie and this is hollywood for you is that Ethan Hawke is a fucking genetically inferior specimen. Okay, movie. Like, yeah, it's Ethan th- Hawke. It's Ethan um, motherfucking Hawke in the 90s. He looks like Ethan Hawke. Yeah. You know, yeah, he's got no, a body he, like Ethan Hawke. But he's whatever. got a body like Ethan Hawke. But yeah, the whole idea of, you know, human spirit or, or free will, right? Th- I mean, the, this is what you're rooting for versus genetic engineering, right? I mean, mm. we're, we're like, we, we know that we are a flawed fucking entity i mean it's it's thrown into us when it comes to religion you know like dying for our sins you're imperfect oh, yeah the, like it's that's funny the- that no i mean i'm glad you brought that up because those quotes at the beginning of the movie that i kind of made like a flippant joke about like normally I, I think quotes at the beginning of the movies are not always good or necessary and usually they're kind of pretentious uh but every once in a while i'm wrong uh believe it or not uh So the quotes at the beginning of this movie, they touch on what you're talking about exactly. So one of them is, consider God's handiwork, who can straighten what he hath made crooked. And it's Mm. from the Bible, right? Mm -hmm. So there you go, right? Like, we're talking about God making people the way that they are supposed to be made, not people making people the way they're supposed to be made, right? So 
but you could interpret that as you could go deeper. You could say, oh, the movie's saying we shouldn't fuck with God. Ethan Hawke was made the way God wanted him to be made, which is why he succeeds. You could say that if you want, but you could also go deeper. You could say, well, one of the one of the most uh, timeless debates to come out of Christianity is this idea between the way God makes you and free will, the way God says you should be and the way you are allowed to deviate from that because you have free will, right? So like in there too, God could be a metaphor for this society. It doesn't have to be God, God. Um, so there's something there to chew on if you would like. The other quote, the second quote is, I not only think that we will tamper with mother nature, I think mother wants us to. Um, and this is from like a, a, a scientist named William Galen, Willard Galen. Um, and I, I checked his Wikipedia. He's, he's not a confirmed uh, eugenics guy. So I don't want to throw shade there, but it's, it seems a little like we're talking about basically he's sort of representing cult, the culture of the film in the quotes. And then Ethan Hawke is almost more like that first quote. So I, here I am, like I wrote in my notes, two quotes at the beginning of the movie, LOL. And then after the movie's over, I went and I went and really dug into the quotes and was like, ah, nope, they, they belong there. They should have been there. Good job, movie. Yeah. Um, I do want to just take a second because I think this might have been like the the fifth or sixth time, uh, sixth time that we've mentioned you eugenics as like a like a general term thinking like you and you know what it means. I know what it means. But for the listeners that maybe have no idea what that fucking means at its core, eugenics is essentially the idea of improving like the hu- human species by selectively like, breeding. Yeah, selectively breeding people with uh, more more desirable or more desirable uh, hereditary like traits. Basically, yeah. it's the idea it's of the, like, breeding out disease, essentially, yeah. and yeah. creating your master race. It's the Ubermensch shit. Popular <laughs> popular people who love eugenics: Adolf Hitler, yep, and Charles Lindbergh, uh, Black Eye on America. But like, yeah, I mean, it, like you said, it's. It's selective breeding to create a master race, Ubermensch, Superman, whatever you want to call it. Yep. And it's nasty, nasty stuff because it, uh, like this film, um, shows us inevitably will lead to systemic uh, discrimination mm-hmm. on a level that uh, we, you wouldn't even be able to combat. You yeah. wouldn't even be able to have civil rights activists because they would be completely shut out for being genetically inferior. Like they would immediately be labeled as inferior, not just like in a way that like racist people do against people of color now without any scientific basis, it would be based in science, which is where it's very, very, very dicey, which is why it's a bad, bad thing. Bad, bad thing. It's, it's, it's dressed up in science. It's, it's wearing, it's wearing all the draperies of science, but it is rooted in, uh, racism it's rooted yeah, for in sure. for sure yeah, and discrimination and, and discrimination which, which is really interesting because of the fact this movie like places this idea of like a utopia where everything is perfect right like where mm-hmm. you know you're you're just you're giving your 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 children like the the best possible chance for success they're they're still you just the finest versions of you so you have like, i think this that's utopia. a line directly from the movie yeah. So yeah. you've got this utopia, but it's really dystopia. So this movie really does do, do a great job of having like a like a a utopia versus dystopia like theme that's going on within this movie. And mm-hmm. I eat that shit up, you know, just oh, everything everything is perfect, but by being so perfect, just how imperfect and how yeah. more flawed everything is. It because it's so fucking human. Like this yeah. is what we're. This is this is this is why this movie is the not too distant future. By giving us more technology, you know, we the we're capable of doing some really really fucking horrible things. Uh, it wasn't first coined in in, in Spider Man, but it's that with great power comes great responsibility, and we don't have the the means to uh, manage ourselves. We don't. We don't. Yeah. No, no. And if anything, it's, you know, looking at you, Norfolk Southern, but uh, it's with great power comes no responsibility in the real world, but whatever. But uh, like to 
to your point earlier before I went off on my little tizzy there, um, it looks utopian. Um, one of the great examples of that is I kind of mentioned it earlier, but it's like we have this parallel between like Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman are out on a date and it's like it's all very like mid-century, which I kind of like. It's like mid-century future. Like everything's kind of like there's like everybody's wearing like like back, backless gowns and and they have like suits and ties. All the cars are and, from like the fifties and sixties. Oh, has like, like a mid-century 80s. vibe. Yeah, yeah. Um, so they're in, they're having this date. Meanwhile, the police are doing their business, um, trying to find this murderer. And um, the sheer amount of manpower that is out to to catch this murder kind of tells you how rare murders are, even though they never say that. They don't beat you over the head with it at all. It's not like a, 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 a it's not like a minority report kind of thing. Like murders don't happen. But I mean, they have like the force is out mm-hmm. to find this one murder, and they're rounding murder. people up. And 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 um, Ethan Hawke's brother Anton. Uh, shows up at the scene where all these people are being rounded up uh, and it's like kind of like an it's like a industrial park it's like kind of near like an overpass there's like chain link fences everywhere it's like suddenly we're away from this glitzy glammy kind of like art deco-y date world that Ethan Hawke is that this like this this like nightclub where he is with Uma we're like in this skeezy part of town and Alan Arkin, who is who is um, the the kind of lead detective underneath Anton, has some line about, oh, well, we went where all these uh, invalids are. We went where the invalids are and we rounded them up, meaning that like they are living in a shitty part of town in mm-hmm. this like they're living in this dystopian world. But because the movie centered on. Uh, and again, like this kind of speaks to like what we we're talking about earlier with Ethan Hawke being pretty selfish because the movie centered on Ethan Hawke and his singular like laser focus on subverting Ooh. the system and getting into Gattaca. We really don't see the world where people like him actually live and come from. Yeah, he's not a hero that learns anything. Um, and that's why I think the the final moment with like Xander Berkeley is so like why that resonates i think with me and i think maybe that's even why it resonates with him where he himself gets a little misty um because he's never he's never done anything for anybody else like the entire movie he you know maybe you say uma thurman because you know he's just trying to get his dick wet but like he doesn't yeah, he do lets anything. Her, he lets her hair blow he in the wind go, or something. Right? Come on. But everything yeah. is so laser focused on me. I have to accomplish like everything that he's done. And, you know, hey, fair point. He had a rough fucking fucking life and uh, everything was against him. And he's like, I'm going to accomplish something to prove that I can that, you know, I can do this. But he's not saving anybody. He's not doing anything. He's not making any fucking sacrifices in this movie. It's Which just is why it's like means- important that the Xander Berkeley scene happens, like almost from like a screenplay standpoint. Yep. Like he is redeemed through no action of his own. Mm-hmm. Be- but in kind of a realistic way, like sometimes you're redeemed because other people are inspired by what you're doing, even if what you're doing is selfish. I guess. Yeah. You yeah, know, it's no. it's kind of an indirect, he's an indirect hero in that way, I guess. But uh, it's it's an interest. It, it it needed to be there. Like it has to. It why the movie works, and and I say why the movie works because I mean the the filmmakers argue the movie didn't work because the movie was a monumental failure. It had like a thirty oh, really? some million dollar budget, gross like twelve thirteen million dollars oh, in wow. the box office. And I'm the only one of my friends that I know of that saw that movie in the theater. And oh, for sure. Uh, but but I, I mean, admittedly, I watch every fucking movie that I can in the theater, but nobody saw it. Nobody saw it. Nobody knew about it. It it was a, a just a, a failure. But the reason and granted why I love the movie now, like critically, the critics love it. And the movie is starting to find an audience. We're like, oh, this movie is pretty fucking genius. Oh, it came it's, out, a like, cult, it's a cult, it's a cult classic, right? Yep. And it, it, I told it came I out. told some folks I was coming on to your your program to talk about Gattaca. And they were like, oh, hell yeah, that's a great movie. And it I was is. like, it, it, is, mean, it totally. is a wonderful movie. But they're the 
the audience is slowly, you know, it, it slowly found themselves and it, it, it's growing and people are like, oh, it is a smart movie. It is a really, really, really genius film. But the reason why this movie works at its core, and I've got like several notes about it, and we've, we've talked mm-hmm. about them several times, but it's Xander Berkeley's doctor character that he's, he's that the re, like the most human element of, of this movie is like, because he's known the entire fucking time and he's known everything that he's doing and not that he doesn't just rat him out, but he's looking at him as like, all right, well, my, 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 you know, my kid isn't what they said he was going to be. And, you know, like how am I like as a dad, what can I, what can I say? And he, it's just so good. And then at the end that like, I've known this whole fucking time. There's still, there's still good in this world. And even though you were a valid, I know you're not really a valid. I'm still going to embrace that whole idea of like your, your perseverance in the human spirit. And that is more important than what, what data says on a computer. And I think that's, it's almost that. like Xander Berkeley's son or like Xander Berkeley is going to be like the one who turns Ethan Hawke into this symbol, not mm. Ethan Hawke. Like, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like he, he's, he's the one that turns Ethan Hawke into the champion for the invalids. Right. Like in, in the sequel that hasn't, right. that yeah, doesn't in, exist. In the right? sequel that will never happen. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, Because Ethan Hawke is, is, uh, you know, and you root for Ethan Hawke because we're all Ethan Hawke in that in that sense of, well, we're all natural born. And imagine living in this world where you are considered a lesser specimen because of the fact that you didn't have all the the shitty defects that we are that we all have within us, like just kind of, you know, deleted before we were born and we're not far away and neither i don't i mean just by looking at you i don't think either one of us are you know uh six two six three men but uh sorry i'm gonna have to jump in here and say i am solidly six two it's one of the only things i have going for me i'm not bald and i'm six two sorry if you're bald and you're not and you're under six two these are just things that my wife likes about me. So I'm clinging on for dear life over here to anything I have, <laughs> yeah, which like, is those are other elements, <laughs> just things that you can just delete and imperfections and right. whatever. Like, and you, then- mentioned, you mentioned height. Uh, Ethan Hawke is shorter than Jude Law in the film. Yep. And, and that's where I was going with that. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Go ahead. Take it away. No, 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 please. No. Um, but the, the idea like uh, he, that his character was two inches shorter so what does that mean? How are we going to do that? Oh, we're just going to fucking like bone saw uh, his, uh, his his shins apart and then basically try to find a way to increase yeah. two inches of height to him. Which is so gnarly. That is a one of the best cuts in the movie, by the way, um, where Ethan, where Tony Shalhoub says, um, you know, there's just one more thing because Ethan Hawke cuts his hair just like Jude Law. And he gets contacts because he wears glasses in the film. And also Jude Law has different colored eyes. And he kind of has this moment where he whips around from the mirror. And it's almost like the uh, I'm too sexy for my montage you would have in another movie. He's supposed to turn around and Tony Shalhoub and Jude Law are supposed to go, yeah, bud, and give him a big thumbs up. Like, that's it. That's the outfit. And instead, Tony Shalhoub, he goes, it's perfect. And Tony Shalhoub says, not quite. He's yep. two inches taller than you. <laughs> and, you and, and Ethan Hawke is like, no, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Anything but that smash cut to bone saw noise and a bone saw just descending. And you don't see, you know, the, the surgery, uh, thankfully. But you do see the aftermath, which is Ethan Hawke in these insane leg braces with like tins and wires everywhere. And he has to just lay there in pain. Uh, and and I think it says that because uh, a Jude Law's character's name is Jerome, uh, something to the effect of Jerome never questioned my commitment after that. Mm-hmm. As you know, because he's he's like laying there in pain, healing from this surgery to make him two inches taller so that he will be just like Jude Law, which is crazy because obviously, as we learn in the film, 
um, he doesn't exactly look like Jude Law. I mean, Ethan Hawke is a good looking guy. Jude Law is a good looking guy, but they don't look identical. And there's an interesting point they make in the movie because Ethan Hawke, once they know, the investigators know that there's an invalid working in Gattaca somewhere, they they put his picture up everywhere, what he looks like, because they have his photo associated with his genetic material. So there are pictures of Ethan Hawke with his glasses on all over Gattaca, and no one makes the connection between him and who he's pretending to be, which is Jerome. Uh, because, as the actual Jerome says, Jude Law... They don't see you when they look at you. They see me because this future has become so enmeshed in um, and so obsessed with genetic perfection that all you see is a person's genetic uh, like identity. You don't even see their face anymore, which I think is totally yeah. a fascinating idea, uh, especially in this like era of like facial recognition and shit that we're heading into now. Right? Like it's, it's, it's like, it's an area where the movie decided it's like one of these things that I love about sci-fi. It's like sci-fi does not have to be a fucking crystal ball that perfectly accurately predicts the future. It's more about looking at a, at a, a at an issue or a moment that's happening currently and, and extrapolating something from it and creating this, uh, like biosphere wherein that idea can be explored to its radical end mm -hmm. so this movie is just about genetics and looking at genetics right it doesn't have to be perfectly predicting all other elements of future society you know which is why it's able to play with some of these weird stylistic things like everything looks like it's from the 50s uh so i just think it's kind of like a perfect example of like um the thinking man's sci-fi as opposed right. to like um a sci-fi uh, property that's really hell bent on trying to actually, which you'll never be able to successfully do, actually predict what the future will look like based off where we are right now in every aspect of life, which it, it never would. And they they basically do away with it with one line, with that line from Jude Law, like saying, "Like, look, get over it." Yes, he doesn't look exactly like him, but in this future, no one fucking gives a shit. Because yep. he's so genetically perfect, they got fucking stars in their eyes when they look at him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and again, like the DNA is really what they're looking at. And what I love is they did such a great job, uh, whether it was in the, on the page or if that was something that the uh, director of photography or if that was something that Andrew Nicholas, the, the, the director, wanted to do as well. But we do have symbolism of like these, like these kind of like spirals. To the point that oh, it, yeah. it's literally a helix. Like even the, mm -hmm. the stairs in his home is yes. a helix, right? Like yes. we have like these DNA, the the whole idea, like the 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 lettering of Gattaca that I mean it comes from like from like the helix and everything. Like the whole idea of science within this movie is so specific, and that those are the elements that we're really trying to track in this movie. And yeah, it's it's just it, it's fun, and maybe you don't pick it up the first time you watch it, but on like repeat, uh, like on second, like viewing, third, third viewing, what have you, you do start to see some of some of these like visual symbolisms that are that are thrown out there. Like, oh, I see that, I see yeah. that. Ooh, yeah. It's it's an interesting concept too. It's like, and Andrew Nichol, the director, uh, writer, and director. Uh, it's not like he isn't aware of the impact of what a face is and how we identify with how a person looks because he fucking wrote the Truman show. He wrote the Truman show, which is all about yep. this fucking recognizable guy. Anybody would know him anywhere in the earth, you know? So mm -hmm. it's like, he, he's just sort of like playing with this one idea, which is like kind of getting back to my earlier comment of like, He's doing that sci-fi writer's thing of saying, like, let me just take one idea and blow it up and then yep. contain it inside a world that is built to sustain the idea itself, not put it in a world that is supposed to actually be some sort of, like, accurate representation of where we're going in the future. Even though with Gattaca, you know, with, like, all the moral stuff and a lot of the philosophical elements, he is totally, like, he's he's proving to be very right you know, and weirdly enough, Truman Show too. You know, I mean, I hate these people with more than life itself, Andrew. But like, 
Kanye and Kim Kardashian's kids are going to be like Truman people someday. Like, so he kind of has yep. this is kind of batting a thousand with that. I'll say where, where he does fall down a little bit is that in time movie, which is, it's a film that it, that exists. And, and some people will say it's good and others will say they've never seen it, which is probably at the larger camp. You know, and I'm, I'm okay with people not seeing this movie or not knowing this movie because of the fact that there are many movies, whether good, bad, large, small, insignificant, monumental that I've seen that other people haven't. I, I just, I enjoy cinema as, as an art and, and by seeing it, I feel that it gives me a way that I can look at the world, be a little bit more educated. It gives me something that I can then subsequently have conversations with people. And if they haven't seen it, then, you know, whatever, you know, they're, they're missing out or maybe they don't, they don't, they don't need it within their own lives, but that's why like my preferred medium it, or media is, is cinema. That that's, that's why I have a whole fucking like podcast dedicated to it because that that's the art form that, you know, I, I love, I love paintings. Um, I love poetry. I, I love, you know, I, I love literature, but yeah, my I'm just, preferred... I'm just waiting for you to say, I love lamp as you're looking I, around I, the I room. Love lamp. I, I love, love lamp. You're just looking at things in your room, aren't you? Um, <laughs> Andrew, are you just looking at things in the room? Yes. I love I mean, lamp. You know, so, you know, whatever, whatever it is, whatever people are passionate about, whatever people are, whatever people are interested in, I've gotten to the point in my old age that I don't give a shit if people have seen a movie or haven't seen a film. Doesn't, doesn't bother me. Have you I, seen In Time? Yes. What did you think? It wasn't bad. It, wa- it wasn't. It wasn't my favorite. This is the one where, it, in the not too distant future, again, you can live forever if you're rich and you buy time. But if you're not rich, you die at like 28 or something like that. More so or every, less, I think. Everybody I think looks 28. Like Olivia Wilde plays Justin Timberlake's mom, but she's Olivia Wilde. Oh my God, was that Olivia and then Wilde? A, and then Amanda Amanda Seyfried is, Amanda is the, Seyfried, is the yeah. girl. Mm-hmm. And then we're like, we're always running because we have to be in time or something. And it's like, there's a concept there that's successful. Uh, but then th- there's an action movie element that's yeah. trying to be shoehorned into the film that really doesn't work. And then and when the you look doesn't at stick it, doesn't stick the landing. Nor when you look at his he- body of work, it's like, well, of course the, he's not an action movie guy. Like one of the biggest, uh, air, I'm going to use air quotes again, action scenes we get in Gattaca outside of the swimming in the night swimming, which is actually a truly tense and terrifying scene uh, so, is Ethan Hawke trying to cross the road without his glasses on. Yeah. Like that. This is not an action movie. This guy's not really an action writer. It's, it's, it's again, like I, I used the, the phrase a minute ago. So this is like, this is a thinking person. Sci-fi. This yeah, is a thinker. And this movie is serious as a fucking heart attack. Like they, like everything about this movie is taken so seriously. There, there's a very couple little jokes, jokes few, in the yeah. movie, but so I get why this movie, I don't think it's, I don't think it's hard to appreciate or hard to get something out of, but it also can like teeter that line of, yeah, this might be boring to some people. I get, I, I, I can see it. I can see it because there's not shit blowing up. Um, there's a murder that happens and it comes to almost nothing nothing really at the end because nobody really gives a fuck that it's Gore Vidal as a killer. Yeah. Gore Vidal. Gore Vidal is a killer. And the movie. Gore Vidal is in this movie, by the way. Yeah. Gore Vidal. No big deal. No big deal. He's in this movie and he's the killer. But you know what? You don't fucking care. It doesn't doesn't matter. matter. There is something in that though. I don't want this to get away from us. And there's another thing I don't want us to get, I don't want us to get away from us because I know we're, running into that time but yeah um gore vidal says and this is another uh example of this system having deep flaws um he says at one point in the movie because alan arkin uh because gore vidal works he's a higher up at gattaca and he was really pushing for this mission to happen ethan hawk's mission and at one point alan arkin says well maybe you killed this guy because he was trying to derail this mission and Gore Vidal says, check my profile. I don't have a violent bone in my body. He is the killer. Yep. So on paper, yep. his genetics say he doesn't have a violent bone in his body. 
his genetic profile, and yet he committed murder. So mm -hmm. that is something that's in this film. It's not there on an accident. They weren't just like, oh, shit, ooh, we better button up this murder uh, subplot and get on with it. No, it was intentional. That line was intentional. This is a writer-director. So it's not like, you know what I mean? Like, it's not yep. like he, he wrote the fucking screenplay. Every line is precious to him while he's filming it as well. Um, so I thought that was merited a moment to stop and think about. Like, there is an example of a flaw in this system, right? He shouldn't be capable of murder, and yet he killed a guy. Right. So that's interesting to think about. The other thing I don't want us to get too far away from if is the scene when Ethan Hawke and Uma Thurman go on their date and they go to see this pianist. And at the <laughs> uh, end of this guy's crazy sonata, he throws his glove in his gloves into the audience and Ethan Hawke catches one and he gives it to Uma Thurman. She holds it up and it has six fingers. And then there's a brief conversation about how the pianist has an extra finger on each hand so that he can be an even better. He was genetically engineered to be this insane piano player and to write music that normal 10 fingered people couldn't play because you would need 12 fingers to play this music. This to me signaled the beginning of the next phase, wherein even people like Jude Law, who are engineered out the ass to be perfect, are going to be the second class citizen to the, right. to the next generation that's coming up who have four arms or bigger brains or, you know, um, more fingers it starts with more fingers but where does it end right like it that to me was a signal bigger that, equipment like uh yeah bigger <laughs> like equipment Vincent. xander berkeley is just gonna be fainting with the next generation <laughs> that comes up he's gonna it's be side it's just like <laughs> slamming down there's gonna be like a sound effect while this thing like it's gonna be, it's gonna be like basketball <laughs> 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 uh, anyway serious stuff people clearly mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah, um, that, that's a really interesting point. And there's there's certainly conversation for what. Yeah, what what that world looks like, I I shudder to think of a bunch of 12 fingered 18 inch like fucking hogs running around yeah, everywhere. Yeah. I mean, but this is our future, people. This yeah. is our future. Get ready for it. Batten down the hatches because it's coming. <laughs> Hopefully it's not. Um <laughs> But all right, um, I want to I mean, you know, it's not a podcast if I don't if I don't throw a little quiz at you. And all right, let's do it. I think I think we've covered uh, a lot of this. I do want to get a, maybe a check, line of dialogue or two or if check my notes, else. checks, notes, checks, notes, swimming in uh, glasses, question mark. OK. All see. right. Another note I had was we shed 500 mil, million cells a day. Question mark? Is that true? That's crazy. Do we shed 500 million cells a day? Hopefully that's not one of the questions you're asking me because I'll get it wrong. No, but that, that was something in there. Um, a line, like one of the last lines of the movie uh, that I love is, for someone who was never meant for this world, I must confess, I'm suddenly having a hard time leaving it. Yes. I also, we, we do need to do a little bit more service to Uma Thurman, who is good in this movie. Oh my God. And it's like, she's like, it's a pillar of the 90s, Uma Thurman. That's how you know you're watching a 90s film because she's in it. Uh, and she's doing a great job. And her character is a little enigmatic. Uh, and I would say, um, even though she acts the shit out of it, a bit underwritten, I'm kind of yeah. confused at points uh, why Ethan Hawke waits until the last possible second to initiate a relationship with her. Um, and why she has any interest in him at all beyond uh, when she takes his hair uh, or it's actually Jude Law's hair when she goes into his desk and takes one of these hairs he leaves laying around and she takes it to a shady back alley uh, sequencing company, which I kind of love that whole scene as well. Um, and that's where the lady says, oh, 93 percent, baby. Good work. He's a yeah. keeper or something to that effect. Um it's all a little unclear exactly what her angle is. And at Gattaca, it's like she is in line for a mission, mm -hmm. but she also has a heart condition too. Mm -hmm. So she's a natural born person who just happens to be uh, gifted and lucky 
Right. But there is an outside chance because she wasn't genetically engineered to be perfect. There's an outside chance that she could have a heart condition. So that kind of like puts her on the back burner for missions. I think, uh, yeah, I think, and they could have done a little bit. Again, the movie's not perfect. Although I love this. And like, I think in my, my own individual, like out of 10, I give it like an eight and a half because I, I really fucking love this movie and I love the music and I love the idea and the themes of the film. There are elements the movie is lacking at and, and it's not from performance. I think they're both fantastic. It's but, a product of its time, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, the female um, character is a little underwritten. Yeah, she she is she is underwritten. And it's also a debut uh, film from a director that maybe thought they had their, their everything was there and it was just they it was overlooked or under underdeveloped. But I think her catching him looking up is something, or just seeing yeah. the fact that it's not just He's there, but there is a passion that right. exists. That he, he doesn't have this like entitlement. There's mm-hmm. still like an awe, kind of. And she's attracted to that. Although, again, this goes to the underwritten. That's not explored, and it's only really kind of conveyed with just her looking and her actions. But it's not. It's not really tr- like totally explored, even with two or three bits of line of dialogue, which I think could have also gone a long way. The movie isn't a lengthy movie. I don't think it, I don't think it's over two hours. I no, it, no, no. Yeah. I think the movie take, you know, uh, falls under two, uh, but another, maybe shit, another 30 seconds of, of some type of relationship, relationship building or a bit of dialogue may have gone a there's, long way. There's there. been, there's a noir vibe to the movie. Oh, um, for sure. So it almost uh, I almost chalked it up to the kind of trope from noir films of the dame being attracted to this antihero just because he is an antihero. And Mm. in noir, you see this a lot, uh, which because noir is predominantly written by men. Um, and I'm talking like more traditional noir. I know there's neo noir now, which is a totally almost, it almost deserves to be. It is its own category. But in traditional noir, um, a lot of what you're supposed to infer from a female character, a lot of what you're supposed to to infer it comes from her desires towards the main character. That's supposed mm-hmm. to tell you who she is. She likes this guy, or that means she's this type of woman. They don't really. Right give uma a backstory they don't really give uma a lot of agency because you're supposed to be inferring things from her based on her attraction to ethan hawk and who he is as a character Mm -hmm. so like that's a criticism i have of this film and again like if you are a listener of the show and you remember the first time i was on i don't tend to view films that are from a different era i don't subject them to like the same rigors of the era that we're currently living in because it's not fair and it's not realistic right. it's a moment in time um so like this movie is a product of the era when it was made and as a result uma thurman's character comes across as a bit um like kind of under baked uh mm-hmm. because she's there to serve a different purpose and we have moved past that hopefully we're moving past that as a society so um, they shouldn't reboot Gattaca, but if they did, I wouldn't be surprised if she had a lot, if her character had a lot more to do. Yeah, um, no, that's without, I, th- I think that's very, very perfectly, perfectly stated. I will say like cast wise, whether it is Alan Arkin, whether Lauren Dean, which I think he was great. I love the the swim scene between him and Ethan Hawke. I like the the, the, the two younger versions uh, of them. Yeah, doing it's that great same casting. Thing. They look just like them. It's crazy. Yeah, th- fantastic. Fantastic. When they make the transition from the actor playing young Ethan Hawke to just actual Ethan Hawke with a different haircut and, and a shave, it's pretty fucking seamless. Mm-hmm. Um, even fucking Casey Jones from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles as, oh as their God, father. God, right? That yeah. blew me away. That floored me. I couldn't believe it when I saw him in this movie. Yeah. Dean uh, Norris, I, as we've mentioned. Dean Norris, we Norm mentioned. Al. I do want to mention that you wouldn't know because you don't see her whole fucking face. You only see her eyes. 
but Maya Rudolph is wow. the doctor uh, delivering Vincent in the very beginning. Uh, I think that was like her screen debut, which is kind of like a like a fun little like Easter egg uh, out there. Um, yeah, that is that's a that is totally wild. Blair Underwood, he makes Blair an Underwood as the the like like genetic like doctor like given the whole spiel of like oh. he's still you. Just the how about the this Ernest part. Ernest motherfucking Borknine is in this movie. Yeah, Ernest Borknine as, as, as a janitor. Sounds, great, yeah, as a janitor, fucking crazy. Oh, the the very very last thing I'll mention is that I don't know if you heard about the original credits that were or were not the original credits, but how the movie was supposed to end. Mm -mm. So originally written into the script, and his heart explodes the second they take off. Yes, he dies. He dies. (laughs) Uh, They actually, it's actually like a, it's actually like um, supposed to be related to the Challenger. So the whole thing, like Jacob's Ladder, like it's it's all taking place Um, in like seconds before he dies. What, yeah, <laughs> what they did actually originally, but the audiences were like, fuck no. And I think the everybody was like, no, this is not the way to do it. Is that oh, we're going to, okay, we're fine. What they were going to do is they were going to show Abraham Lincoln, Albert Einstein, different, like different geniuses mm. and their defects. Oh, so, like, yeah. Our, and so you would see, what would the issue was with Abraham Lincoln? Uh, I forget. Um, depression, depression, I think. Maybe. Uh, probably. Uh, Albert Einstein dyslexia. Oh, I, I know what it was with Abraham Lincoln. He had a bullet in his head. Yeah, that, I mean, that, that definitely yeah, yeah, didn't was, help. Did not yeah, help. Yeah. But like uh, Alfred, uh, Albert Einstein was like depression. And, you know, they so they, they cover like. Julius Caesar had. Uh, bad friends. He had bad friends. He had bad tasted friends. No, he he had he he had uh he had uh Joan of Arc sickness there. What do they call that there? Uh, 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 uh seizures that come on. Mm. You know. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, people have had it's it's like goes hand in hand. Like sometimes it's kind of the idea that like sometimes the greatest people have these like quote unquote genetic defects. Yep. Um, Same thing with um, Van Gogh. So they they showed a bunch, like in images, a bunch of like people that we all recognize, but their defects. And yeah, in this world, how they wouldn't have been born. So, but it just didn't strike right after too, the movie that you had just seen. Smart. And I'm, Honestly, it's too fucking smart. It's too it. It's too much thinking. It's too much thinking. I think by doing it, my my take is it's just a little bit like too fucking like pretentious, like. Like you think your movie is that good? You just want to point out like this is what could have could have been with these people. I don't know. Yeah. Um, but all right, you know what? None of that fucking matters. We are we are we are ah, definitely at the tail end. Let's do it. All right. Question number one: How long was Anton's? No. How long was Vincent's uh, estimated lifespan? Hmm. Thirty-four. 30.2. Ah, I knew it was a 30 something. Should have been taking better notes. Jude Law's character was Jerome Eugene, right? Yeah. And so he was going to go by Jerome. So he asked him to call, uh, call Jude Law by Eugene. Do you know what Eugene actually means? It's interesting. Huh. The name Eugene? Mm hmm. No, I don't. It means well born. Oh, interesting. Is mm-hmm. a is it a biblical name that I'm guessing? Uh, I mean, I think it's Jewish, but oh, I I think quizzing, it's, I'm quizzing you now. I think it's Hebrew for like well born. Wow, I think. interesting, interesting. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yep, yep, yep. Okay, um, o, o for two, o for two. It's fine, it's fine. Don't don't cancel me. Don't you're, you're genetically yeah. no, that's edit it. me you're out. Done. You're done. How about this? What is Titan? Titan is a moon. Titan is the moon is a moon of uh, is a moon of Jupiter. Well, Saturn, but that's okay. Shit. All right, sorry. But you, I'll give it to you. So one, one for three. <laughs> do you do you recall the term they use for someone who bar for someone who borrows the DNA of another person? I'll take two different versions. There was something like a ladder lifter or a ladder borrowed ladder borrowed ladder. That's what it was. Or and D. Uh, DNA, 
Okay, tell me. Degenerate. Degenerate. LOL. As that, to that degenerate. One, sorry, LOL. That's I should stop saying that. I just watched that Kirby Enthusiasm episode where the lady's always saying LOL instead of just actually laughing. Uh, <laughs> it's really annoying, so I'll stop doing it. That's right. great. Degen- degenerate. Come on, guys. And lastly, we spoiled this one, but how did Xander Berkeley know yeah. Dot, oh. dot, dot, ellipsis. How did yeah. he know? He know he knew because uh Ethan Hawk be gripping that equipment with the wrong hand. You know what? I'm gonna give you four bonus points. Five hey, for five. Ding, 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 ding. All right. That's better than I did on Starship Troopers, a movie I've seen infinitely more times <laughs> than this. <laughs> um dude, Dylan, as always, it's always a pleasure talking with movies. I think I love I think, it. I think we I think we cover this one well. I know that we we didn't cover everything, but we left out one very important thing, which is Jude Law is incinerated at the end of this film. He yeah, does, fucking... in fact, finish what he started when he stepped out into traffic all those years before. Yeah, yeah. literally incinerated. He just climbs into bored. an incinerator. Uh, yeah. Another very important thing I don't want to get away from us because it's in my notes. Uh, Ethan Hawke goes into space wearing a suit with a tie. Yeah, yeah, which is like which okay. I think is wonderful. They make these that? motherfuckers run on treadmills and spin around in those spinny deals in the background for the whole movie. And then when they actually get in a rocket ship, they're wearing suits and ties and polished shoes. What is is that? Um, is that 2001? I want to say there was another. Old uh, sci fi film where we have astronauts wearing suits in space wow i don't know if that's 2001 i mean maybe when they're on the moon that there's that whole extended moon base sequence they might be just walking around yeah, like, you're 100 percent right but um now like i'm gonna i'm, I'm gonna, we're gonna hang up we're gonna i'm gonna publish this i'm gonna probably i'm, put in the, I'm gonna put in the show notes I'm there like, you go do that <laughs> yeah i'm just gonna put in the show notes uh so read the show notes you're just gonna see like an arbitrary like sci-fi film reference but i'm gonna go with i'm just gonna go and say 2001 was like their nod for that because but that was intentional yeah 100 percent. you're gonna have him doing that and it um, like threw me it threw me i thought he was just going to work and then it was like oh no he's getting in this the spaceship right now yeah like yeah it's pretty wild anyway uh, weird, shout weird. out to alan arkin for fucking crushing it as Kills it a, in this movie. Kills as a, it. a natural born um uh, human but clearly smarter than yeah anton smarter than um, anton and he knows what is up he can smell yep. it the whole yep. movie he's like he's the closest thing you get to an actual antagonist this entire film and mm-hmm. he's great he's great yeah and he 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 just gives like he he doesn't like berate anton but he's like you were right sir that, like, yeah. and it's, it's all like, no, 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 the delivery i was right i yeah. was right like yeah like everything he's done like he he was the one that like all the shots he did, he was on top of. He cracked the fucking case. He's the one who took the DNA sample from the eyeball of the murdered man and found out that the murderer had spit into his eye when, when yep. he was killing him. He does it all. It's not Anton. Anton fucks up left, right, and center this entire movie. He's actually the biggest, one of the biggest fuck ups in the movie. Talk about failing up your entire life. That's yeah, Anton. Failing, up, failing yeah. up. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the way to end it. Yep. Yeah. Like two. Like a couple of white guys on a podcast, just failing <laughs> up. <laughs> failing up. There you go. Way Andrew, any way you want, anytime you want me back, any movie you want to talk about, you got my number. I'm happy to do it. I'll always make time for you, my friend. Talk to you later. As always, thank you very much for Dylan hopping on the podcast. Do me a favor, check out the, the show notes. Uh, there's links to Dylan's website as well as various links to different ways that you can connect with me if you haven't haven't already done so. And we'll have a couple little like tidbits on this movie and a couple other little things that we discussed throughout. But anyway, I'm going to wrap this one up as you as you've been listening to this for like 2 hours anyway. So I think that's enough. I think it's a good place to end it, get it out to you. Leave us a review, like, listen, subscribe, tell your friends, and follow me on various social media channels. We'll see you next time for episode number 99 of Stanford Cinema. Bye, y'all.